Jesus loves me, this I know. Sing, sing, kids. Sing. They are weak. Sing. But he is strong. Yeah. Can you say yes, Jesus? Let them know. tells me me so say it again Jesus loves me Jesus Jesus loves me can you say oh yes Jesus he, he loves me oh, oh yeah yes Jesus why cause the Bible Say one more time, Jesus loves me, just I know. Jesus loves you this. Oh, yes, he does. Oh, the Bible tells me so. Oh, little ones. You must tell them that you are weak, but he is strong. Say, can you clap? Can you clap? Say, yes. Come on, kids. Can you clap? Don't be shy now. Oh, yeah. Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Now, I have brought all these beautiful children here for a reason. My message today is called Stolen Generations. I don't want everybody to look at these beautiful kids. And let me ask you, uh, um, um, who, whose child is she? Uh, no, no, not for matters. Everybody say mine. What about that one? What about that one? That one. All of them? Mine? All over there? Mom. All over there? Mom. Everybody said they're our children. Yes. Thank you, kids. All right. Thank you. All right, kid. Thank you. Kid. That's a lot of kids. For a small church, it's a lot of kids. And there, there are lots of them missing, and, and there's more on the way. <laughs> so we are... We are, we are overloaded with children. We don't do Sunday school because Sunday school takes the children out of church and puts them in children's church. And um, I don't want the children being out of church. God wants the children in church. Let them sing among us. They'll make noise. That's okay. Are we used to the noise already? Just do that. Just go shh, 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 shh. And they'll, eventually they'll stop, you know. And usually when I preach, they're actually quite good when I preach, most of the times, you know? They learn to stop at that point, and um, I don't have too many issues. Sometimes on a Tuesday, they might get a bit noisy. I, um, that's a lot of children. He's lost his way. Mother, this one's missing over here. That's not your mom. Oh, I said, okay, look at He's lost his mom. We're here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and the reason why I want everybody to have a look at them and to own them is because of the purpose of our church and the purpose of God's church. The purpose of our church and the purpose of God's church is to help not only ourselves but to help our children to be saved. And I think it is a priority for every parent or parent-to-be that you understand that your most important mandate in life is not just to feed them, although that's important. It's not just to educate them, it's, that's important. 
It's not just to show them love, that is important, but the most, you're not lost, you're just enjoying wandering around the place. It, it, is, it is to bring them into the world, and then when they're here, it is to help them to find their true purpose of why they're here. So, a lot of parents would want their children to be great basketball players, and I, I wish my son was a great basketball player. Well, I, I, I oftentimes complain to my son because um, one of my buddies back in America, he got married to a girl and her children came out 6'10", 6'11", and they're all signing multi-million dollar NBA contracts. Don't laugh at me, Naomi. <laughs> Uh, and so I oftentimes complain to my son, you know, like, why didn't you grow? You're supposed to be 6'10". We only do that for fun. We have fun in my house, you know. And um, I oftentimes thought, what, what is more important than all of that is to help my children to be saved. Don't sign nothing. Don't earn a penny. I don't care. Just be saved. And hopefully by the grace of God, I can help all of them to be saved. But I'm going to do my best that if they want to be saved, because they have to, they have to want to be saved as well. So this is Charms. You can try to help your son to be saved, but he's got to want to be saved. And I stole him. He's my son too. So our, our, our sons have to want to be saved. They've got to have that want to, the desire to be saved. You know. Brooke wants to be saved. She came to me yesterday and said, Rob, Next baptism, can I get baptized? Amen. Everybody give a hand. And I want everybody to understand that if we as a church, we don't do our job, then there's an ugly word that, there, that exists in Australia. I never heard of that ugly word until I came to Australia and the phrase that is used in Australia is a stolen generation. Everybody knows about the issues and justifications for why children were taken from their parents and whether you agree or disagree is not really my point today, it's irrelevant to me. It's just that it's an ugly word. It sounds, it sounds ugly. The word itself is ugly, stolen generation. It's, it's, a, it's an ugly word. And the, the, the background of it, regardless of, um, of justification, is, is, always, is always negative. Now you see, Australia speaks about stolen generation. But I want everybody here to understand this morning, I want to I speak about stolen generations with an S. Now if you think the concept or the idea of a stolen generation in a country has a negative impact or a negative implication and the way this sounds awful, I want everybody to look at stolen generations from the eyes of God. I was sitting down by the Regan a couple of days ago Last week, a week before, a couple weeks before, I was sitting down with him, and I don't know why. I look at all the children, and they're all playing, and they're all running around the place. And not to be judgmental, but I, I looked at the, at the little children as, as they were playing, and I could, I could see it's going to be easier for that child to be saved than for that child to be saved. And I, and I, and I said, that one is going, to be, is going to be easier to be saved because... Of, I know that the parents are committed to rearing that child as a Christian. I know that the parents, not only are they committed to rearing the child of the Christian, but the parents are Christians. And the, and the parents are striving to be good Christians, to be good examples, to show good spiritual leadership in their home, so their children can be saved. And you can tell because uh, I, I like Sister Hawa. Sister Hawa drags her children 
out on a Tuesday night and the, the, the boy is fast asleep while I'm preaching on the <laughs> crumb and then he gets up, he's all druggy and everything and she drags him home and I go, sister, you know, I know it sounds, it looks so bad, mom's going to be there so she's going to bring him, but that's the best thing for them. You're ingraining something inside of them. And I still say this, I still, I, I use my daughter for an example. I use it for an example, she's a good example. May she keep being, by the grace of God, a terrific example. From, from the day my, my child was born in the church, my daughter never missed church. She, she's always been in church. Maybe she had a cold one day or something, but maybe once in, you know, a few, 10 years or, isn't Bethy always in church? She's always in church. And she, she went to university, she graduated, and she got her degree, and she got her this, and you know, now she's a, a potentially married woman. Keep being good, doesn't change his mind. You know, he can just... I keep telling him, he'll change his mind if you're not good. And, um, and, and, now, and now she's grown up. You, you watch Sister Elizabeth bring uh, Monica, and, and she grows up in the church, and, and, and they grow up in the church. And it, it sounds, you know, like all the parents are very worried about, you know, we've got to keep the kids home because, you know, they, 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 they can't stay out so late uh, because it's so late to bring them out uh, on a, to, to church. So mom and dad, and I'm being critical, I'm just saying, so mom and dad, uh, you know, they stay home and they, they don't bring the kids, they're busy on a Tuesday. And Sunday becomes just a religious practice. And they themselves are not really committing themselves to God sacrificially like they should to be, to be the best example for that child. Now, if we can go to John 10.10, 10, let me show you what you're running the risk of doing. Stolen generations is a nightmare scenario. A nightmare, not where a small proportion of the population in a country, but where an entire world. Bible says this, verse 7, I'm going to go from 10, 7. Then said Jesus unto them again, verily I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. And all ever came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door by me. If any man enter, in ye shall be saved. And shall go in and out and find pasture. Hear this now. The thief cometh not only for one reason does he come. To steal. Everybody say to steal. At the end of that, in your mind, put the word people. You do not understand the seriousness of that scripture until you put the word people. You don't understand the ramifications of what the scripture is saying until you put the word people. You see, Many people have had their homes broken into. And the devil has taken their DVD, their Xbox, their, their, their mobile phone, their money, their keys, their car. They have had, the people have had their homes stolen into and the thief comes, right? And he steals a lot of stuff. Now you see, when you're reading the scripture, your mind is going to say that the thief is coming to steal your stuff. It does not occur to you that the thief is coming to steal people. When God wrote this scripture, he did not reference your stuff. <laughs> Nor does God care about your stuff. Mama Nancy, your house burnt down and you lost all your stuff. Everything was gone. But guess what, Mama Nancy? You got all the stuff back. So God knows that all the stuff that gets stolen can be replaced. But our carnal minds will think that when he says the devil comes to steal, we're, you know, it's like a warning against you. Make sure doors are locked at night. No, 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 no. The thief that he's talking about here 
is not any thief like you've ever known. This is not a thief like a, like a human being, if you understand what he's really trying to say. It's a type, it's a parable of what the devil is actually doing. The only thief that I'm really worried about and the only thief that you should be worried about is a thief that's going to come and, yeah, Brother Regan, if you, if you thought that somebody was going to come and steal your children, you would never sleep. You would, you would never close your eyes. You would stay awake all night and seek and look. You would be so aware. You would never relax. But for me, if a thief comes and my neighbor, uh, you know, she woke up in the morning about two weeks ago, and guess what? A thief would come in, walked into her, her house, into her room, took her wallet, took her this, took her that, left her sleeping. Just took her, he, the thief came for her stuff. And in the morning, she got up on her stuff. Uh, Nancy, our neighbor, our neighbor Maria, you know, she, she got her stuff. She's like, Robert, did, you, did your dogs hear anything? I mean, they were in my room. Yeah, but they weren't there to steal you. They were just there to steal your stuff. Call the insurance company, get them replaced. That's fine. This thief is coming to do nothing else but to steal people and to kill what? Kill people and to destroy people. Understand the fullness of what it is saying. He is coming to steal people, to kill people, to destroy people. He says, I am come that they might have life and that they might, that, that they might have it more abundantly. It's just really funny because no one worries about getting murdered too much. It's almost as if it's something that's so distant from our minds we don't really worry about that. Sister Belinda, a little while ago, she, was, she, she left her... Her garage door open, left a key in the car, went inside. I mean, it's, it's in, you know, when, when she came back, uh, whatever, out in front or whatever, when she came back, there's someone in the car pulling away. Sister Belinda gave, gave pursuit. <laughs> Teresa told her, stop. What are you doing? She wanted to pursue the car, grab the person, pull him out, and <laughs> put some Kenyan justice on them, you know? That's right. <laughs> and so she let the car go. They took this, they took that. But Sister Belinda was safe. Hey, would you believe that two weeks later, another lady? Her, her court, the exact same thing happened, and she tried to stop the thief, and the, the thief did not only come to, you see, when the thief stole your car, you didn't think he came to steal and to kill. And obviously, you, don't, you just don't connect those things oftentimes. Someone's going to come and kill me. That was accidental or incidental. But he, she tried to stop exactly like Belinda tried to stop, and this lady, he ran her over, and he killed her and destroyed her life. So when you read in that scripture, think of it in its fullest, most life-impacting way. The devil is coming to steal people, to kill people, and destroy people, and nothing else. How does the devil steal people, though? So it's a bit of a, bit of a, bit of a strange thing, you know? A bit of a strange thing. In Australia, the stolen generations were apparently taken and brought to other families or government agencies to give them better lives. And uh, the people that were um, the people that were doing it were doing it with the best of intentions. And I'm not judging whether right or wrong. I'm just preaching. I'm not involved with the politics of the country. I'm just preaching. 
You know, there, there, are, there are those who would do awful things in the name of making your life better. Genesis chapter 3 tells us of one such being. It tells us of one such being. It says, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, hath God said that, that you shall not eat of the tree of the garden? The woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of every fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat. You know, I love that point right there because at that point, she is showing, she is showing faith in God. Tremendous faith in God. She is showing, everybody say faith in God. Faith in God. Knowledge of God's word. And thirdly, a lust for nothing. Faith in God, knowledge of God's word, and a lust for nothing is a good state for a soul to be in. Faith in God, knowledge of his word, and a lust for nothing. The devil is going to come, he's going to change some of those conditions that she, that he has found her in. Watch this. What's the devil coming to do? Now you see, in his mind, hear me, hear me, hear me. In his mind, Satan is coming to liberate her from the bondage of serving God. Everybody thinks that we who are Christians, we're in some kind of bondage. You know, we're so terrified of hell. Well, hey, you know, we don't want to go to hell. That's why we serve God, right? Because we're, we're in such terrible bondage. And they would love to do nothing more than to deliver us or deliver our children. Oh, by the way, in Australia, the stolen generation was children. But in the Bible, the stolen generations is everybody, young and old. <laughs> it's a bigger problem. More widespread. Oh, by the way, some of you who are sitting here, if you're not careful, you'll become a part of the stolen generations. Because what has happened in history will repeat itself spiritually over and over. Because no one, hey, you look in Australia today, they stop taking children off their children when, because of various reasons. You know, I guess if you're a bad parent, they'll take them from you, but and they should. But here the devil, devil, devil thinks he's, he in his mind, I want everybody to understand, in the devil's mind, he thinks he is our liberator. He thinks he is doing us a favor. He is insane. For when he left heaven, he thought he was doing himself a favor. I don't want to serve you no more. You've made me. I exist. I'm, I can be free of you. So he has come to bring that liberty to humanity. To set us free from the bondage of serving God. We, 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 we can't drink. We don't, we don't practice uh, uh, sex before marriage and live with our boyfriends, amen? amen. We, we, don't, we, don't, we don't practice all these different things that the world practice. If, if we're going to watch TV, if, it, if it's got rude things in it, we don't watch it, amen? amen. If, if we come across things that are wrong, we turn away from it, amen? amen. Oh, what a, what a bondage, what a, what a bondage we are under. The devil wants you to be free from the bondage. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. All of a sudden, how do, the, how, how do you steal a generation? You begin to change what God said. If you begin to change God's word, that generation will die. If you change God's word, alter God's word, compromise God's word, that generation will die. 
God's word is given unto you to keep you from being stolen, keep you from, from being killed, and to keep you from being destroyed. So, Pastor Robert, if I'm not doing the right thing, let me not take God's word and bring it down to my sinful level. Let me leave God's word the way it is and bring myself back to that level. For if I change God's word, I will destroy myself and all those who are listening to me. I will destroy a generation that God is raising up. Don't change God's word. It says, For God knoweth that in the day that thou eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing both good and evil. I, you know, and now the woman who, who thought she had everything, who knew that, you know, all of a sudden now, she no longer has faith in, in God's, that, that belief in God's word. The knowledge of God's word begins to deteriorate in her mind. Maybe God didn't really mean that. Maybe, you know, you, you, you can't trust the Bible. Did you know you can't trust the Bible, Brother George, because it's written by men? Yeah, yeah, it's written by men. Yes, men under the anointment of the Holy Ghost, moved by the Spirit, wrote. Yes, it is written by men. It, the, the Bible said it was written by men. Keep going. Under the Holy Ghost. Spake by the Spirit of God, anointed by God. Yes, it was written by men. And it, it's such a demonic thing to say, it was written by men. But they leave out that little piece about what the Spirit of God was doing in those men. What's he doing? What's the devil doing when he, when, he, when he talks to people like that? What's he trying to do? He's trying to steal that generation. You see, in that time period I'm reading about in Genesis, Adam and Eve represented that generation. They would become the generators of the next generation. They were the generation. <laughs> oh, you can't call that. Oh, yes, there is. Oh, yes, I can call them that. You know why? Because the Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, he says this. Genesis chapter 2, verses 1, he says, Thus were the heavens and the earth finished, and all the hosts of them. And the seventh day God ended his work, which he had made, and rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in that in it he, he had rested from all, that is, from all that is work which God created and made. These are the, the generations. <laughs> God has brought a generation, these are the generation of the earth, of the heavens and the earth when they were created and God said, I will create man. Hey, God has generated you, he has brought you forth. A generation is what you have brought forth. Who brought Adam and Eve forth? That's right, so they are a generation. God has generated them, now they must generate as well. I generated six of them. All those children here were generated by somebody. It means somebody made you. You represent the whole, the totality of what has been brought forth by those who were generated from before. So Adam and Eve represented a generation. And I love the book of Genesis because it shows you everything that's going to come in a, in a, in a, in a large way, in a mini way. You can understand it so much better just by looking at those two people. Everything you preach, I always say, you go back to Genesis, it's right there. Here is a generation that's going to get destroyed. How? By the devil changing God's word and causing the people that are in that generation to be full of lust. She began to lust. How does the devil destroy generation with? With lust. Why do you think our world is so pornographic? Am I not supposed to sit in church? I'll scream it again then. Why do you think our world is so pornographic? Because the devil is creating, it's, it's silly about stupid. He's, he's creating lust to put that lust, and, and the Bible says, You're of your, you're of your, your father, the devil, and his lust will you obey? 
How does the devil destroy the generation? He introduces them to lust. Heaps of lust. Stacks of lust. More lust than you can throw a stick at. You can poke a stick at. Endless amounts of lust. Walking down the road, there's lust. Going to the left, there's lust. Going to the right, there's lust. Because he knows, I will destroy a generation with lust. If you're letting lust affect you, you're being stolen. If you're letting lust take over your life, you're being stolen. And the stolen generations did not leave with their own permission. They were taken away. But you will leave with your own permission. You'll tell the lust to take me out of the church, to take me out the door, and to drag me to hell for what is nonsense in its essence. You're being stolen. Right before your eyes, with your eyes wide open, you're being stolen. And you're allowing it to be so. And it says, for God created you. God made you in his image. Not to, make, not to be like that. And the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. Hey, you can do whatever you want to do and you won't die. That's a, what a, how do you steal a generation? How do you kill somebody? When you're going to kill him, you tell him, I'm not going to kill you. But you're gonna, he's, he's going to kill you. You tell him, I'm not going to kill you. But he's going to kill you. There's a story, a little kid story about this uh, Wilhelmina Paddle Duck. The fox. The, Jemima. And the duck told her, yes, I'm going to be having a lunch. Would you like to come to my lunch? And she just waddled along with him. Come along. For God knows in the day that thou eat thereof, your eyes shall be open. You shall be like gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired, I like it. Good for food. Ah, oh, I'm hungry now. Good for food. You know, we love, everyone just loves exotic food, don't we? Just, you know? Wow. Pleasant to the eyes. <laughs> you see? You see how he likes that? You see he puts lust? It's pleasant to the eyes. What does lust come from? From what you see. It comes from the eyes. Once you see, your heart desires, your body begins to desire and want for. It's lust. <laughs> When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, and, to, and, and, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took. She gave it to her husband. He took. The mystery of Adam and Eve is that, let's, let's, go, to, let's go to Genesis here. Uh, let me go to uh, Timothy. For the man was not deceived, Timothy. So the woman was deceived, right? God, God, God told her it would kill her, and then she, the devil told her no. So she was deceived. Do you know that Adam was not deceived? He was not deceived. Learn that today. Adam was not deceived. Here is what the Bible says. Adam, you got stolen. How did you get stolen? First Timothy? Verses two, chapter 2, verses 12. 2? 2.14. Yep. Verses 13. And by the way, women, women, women can minister in the church. Brother Good News' wife, she'll sing for us and she, she may give a word or an exhortation. Uh, and if it matter, you'll pray or that person will pray. You understand that? It, it, they're, they're the, uh, and if you guys want to know what 13 means, come, we'll talk about it. I'll leave it for now. I, I, I wanted to give um, Brother Adrian some help with his youth pastoring. First I was going to kick him out of being a youth pastor, but then I thought, no, oh, I need a bit of help. So he got married to my daughter, Bethany, and I thought, she's a good helper. So after you guys are married, you guys can be youth pastors, right? Yeah? That sounds like a good idea. Ain't Bethany? Is that a good idea? You'd be a, you, you and Adrian be a good youth pastors because you're married? Yeah, I guess you will be. You can practice being a girl pastor then. I, 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 yeah, I want, I want girls to pastor, I do. I want, I want them to preach and be able to minister. Someone says, well, it's against the word of God. No, it's not. 
If you think, oh, you think it's a man talking to you now. You think it's a man talking to you. It's a spirit talking to you. If God is not talking to you now, go home. It is God talking. Whether you're male or a female, God should talk. If you listen to me because I'm a man, you, you've, got the, you've got the wrong church. Oh, I can't listen to a woman preach. Anyway, let's not go there. Verses 12 says this, But I suffer not a woman to teach, not to usurp authority over men, but to, but to sit in silence. Don't, sister, good news. You sang, you broke the scripture right there, sister. You're in, you're in rebellion. Of course not. There was a time when a woman being in any position whatsoever was a shameful thing. These are not those days now. Okay? They're, that's over. And thank God they are. There was a time when a woman was a slave. She had no voice. Hey, wait a minute. In Australia, Australia, a, a very contemporary, upwardly mobile country, right? How long ago did the woman start to vote in here? What? Do you mean a woman couldn't vote? No, you couldn't vote. This is what I mean. Women couldn't vote in what, that 70 years ago? In the 30, well, not long, not long. <laughs> That's right. In your days, a woman was allowed to be paid. Yes, yes, okay, yeah. There you go, there you go. Thank God that's finished. You know what I mean? Thank God that's finished. That's so, that's so unequal. Okay, anyway, let me not go there. Verses 13 says this, For Adam, for Adam was, was <laughs> and if anybody want to drag us back in those, in those days, you're gonna, I'm gonna have a, you have a fight on your hand. I want to fight for women's rights. <laughs> eh? I want to fight for women's rights, I am. Who's the head of the house? Who's the head of the house? The man. Okay, he, that doesn't change. But let's not make her into a slave and a servant. It's wrong. It's ungodly. And, and the generations... <laughs> anyway. For Adam was first formed, Adam was first formed, then Eve. Listen to this. And Adam was not... Everybody say, Adam, Adam. was not Adam. deceived. The woman was deceived, but Adam was not deceived. Hear this. Hear this. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. But Adam and Eve, Adam ate of the fruit, she ate of the fruit, and they both fell. So why did Adam, mm, very interesting here, why did Adam get stolen? Hang on for a second. Mm, just think about it. The devil directly came and personally stole Eve by taking her faith out of God's word and giving her false knowledge and false hope, by making her lust for things that she shouldn't have desired. But Adam was not deceived. The woman was deceived. So far too. Here's a good scripture. The Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. How does a devil steal a generation? By making them fall in love or be in love with things which are not of God. That's how he did it. He stole that generation. He stole that one with a, with a love for, a lust for things that God says she shouldn't have. But he stole Eve with a love. And by the way, the Bible doesn't say lust not for the things of the world. He said love not. Because if your love is corrupt, it is in essence lust. If your love is corrupt, it's in essence, if it's, it's just lust in essence. Hey, Adam, how did you, how did you get destroyed? How did you get stolen? Because I, I put something, I desired something stronger than I desired God. I desired something greater than I desired to be in obedience to God. Am I talking to somebody here? You can't have anything that you desire. Not a girl, not a this, not a that, not a boy. Not any, don't desire anything more than God. Because if you desire anything more than God, the devil will use that, manipulate it, and he will steal you. Don't desire wealth. Don't desire fame. Don't desire 
success or don't desire any of those things. Do you know any people were in church, beautiful singers in church, and they would sing in church, and somebody came along and said, wow, you know, you could, you, you could really do well in the world's singing, and they, they lose out on God. Make, you make a lot of money with that voice you got. That sounds beautiful. Listen to this, listen to this, listen to this. Let's go to the book of Judges. Let's go to the book of Judges. Oh, wait, wait. All the way back to Judges, let's talk about uh, John 8, 44. John 8, 44. Let's talk about the thief for a second. John 8, 44. I want everybody to notice that in, in, uh, in, the, in the Ten Commandments, God said, thou shalt not steal, which is people's stuff, but God also said, thou shalt not kill, which is people's lives. You get it? When you murder somebody, you've stolen their life. I'm going to say it again. When you murder somebody, murder is simply a, 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 a more severe type of steal. It's not tangible, but you've taken something from them that God had given to them. You've, you, you've taken a blessing. You understand what I'm saying? So when the Bible says, thou shalt not steal, it's like this or this. But when it says, thou shalt not murder, it means like this. Say it again. Yes, yes. That's how he sees it. I'm going to John what? John 8, 44. Listen, listen to this. Now look at, the, look at the devil. God's figured him out. God, God wants to reveal him to you. John 8, 44 says this. <laughs> so when the world comes to you with all this, don't believe in God, man wrote the Bible, check this out, check that out, just say, no, I know what you're doing. You're trying to steal me. You have to be foolish. Verse 43 says, why do you not, I always read the verse before, why do you not understand my speech even because you cannot hear my word? For you are of your father the devil and the lusts of your father you will now. Listen to me very carefully here. In God's eyes, if you do anything to destroy a person's spirit, walk around the pulpit once. See, if you do anything to destroy a person's spirit in God's eyes, you're a murderer. Be careful how you deal with people. Be careful of the example you set as a Christian. Be careful how you walk before them. Because Sister Fatmata, if I look at you, you're sitting in church, you're supposed to be a Christian, and you do what, what is wrong, and I see your example, or you cause my soul to, to wither and die, you've murdered me. Yes, you have. Be careful. Be careful how you deal with people. I'm telling you about the Holy Ghost again. Because we're not talking about physical murder. Oh no, you're much better than that. But you're spiritually, you're a murderer if you don't behave yourself in a way that helps people to be. And if you behave in a way that causes people to be lost, guess what you are? You're a murderer. Now, did Satan kill her? Did he take a knife and stab her? Did he do it? He didn't do nothing like that. All the devil did was present to her information and presented things that were going to be detrimental to her spiritually. If you do things that causes detriment to people's spirit, Pastor Robert, you better live right. Have I let anybody down? I mean, have, I let, have I let anybody down? Have I, have, I let, have I been a bad example? Did you walk down the street and see my girlfriend in the other arm? Tammy's, me and my girlfriend walking? Mm. No? You didn't hear me cuss or say nothing? I'm, I'm, I'm not, see, I'm, I'm still okay. I haven't murdered anybody because I would hate to murder anybody. I don't want to stand before God with anybody's blood on my hands. Be careful. I, I warn you by the Holy Ghost. Be careful because this is how God sees people. Hmm. Stolen generations. You of your father of the, the devil, his lust will you, 
he was a murderer from the beginning, but he didn't kill nobody, I know, but the way he did, the way he behaved, what he said caused that person to stumble and to fall and to die. He abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of himself his, of his own. I'm done in 10 minutes. For he's a liar, and the father of it. God's like, I didn't tell him to do that. He did it by himself. I didn't motivate that behavior. He did it by himself. He's a murderer. Careful, Christian. Brother Agnes, be careful what example you set before the brother, uh, brother, brother Anthony. Because if Brother Anthony sees you do the wrong thing, he follows you. Or you treat him in a way that's ungodly, you, he'll die. It's your fault. Remember, I told you that. I, te I declare it before God. Be careful. Tammy, be careful how you treat whatever. You know, now it doesn't that make you more accountable? They just say and do whatever you want to do, Pastor. Just, and then you say, oh, oh, mate. Oh. I can tell you some, some horror stories of like, what? Okay. Where are we going to? Let's go to the book of Judges, chapter 2. And let me, let me solidify what I'm saying here really quickly for you. Thank you, Tammy, for being a good example to my children. My wife, Tamara, thank you for being a good example of a, of a spiritual lady in the church. Has Tammy cussed any of you out? Okay, if she did, let me know. I'll talk to her about it. She just quietly goes about her business. Be careful. Listen to this, listen to this. Judges chapter, chapter 2 speaks of a mighty man of God called Joshua. A type of Christ, he brings him into the, uh, into the, into the promised land. Verses 8 says, And Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, he died being 110 years old. You know, I, I, I didn't even have time to talk about the generations that were in Noah's day. After a hundred years of preaching, the word of God had no impact on that generation. They died. Oh, by the way, the, ge the generations in Noah's day, Noah said, there's going to be a flood, and if we don't get in the ark, we're going to die. No one believes. Could they have been saved? Well, for the most part. God said only eight, but you know, yeah. But he told them, you, 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 guys, listen to me here. There's going to be a flood and everyone's going to die. They're like, what? It never rained before. What are you talking about? Rain. What is rain? A mist is coming up out of the ground. And how does the devil destroy the generation? He destroys them with unbelief. They just didn't believe. No, my, Noah told his wife. His wife went in. Noah told his children and their wife. They went in. But the rest of them that didn't believe, guess what? Never entered in. Unbelief. Unbelief, ignorance, lust, which is a love for things that are in the world. Those three things will steal a generation. And right now in our generation, that's, you know, uh, give me give a few seconds here. Listen to this. I'll be quicker. It says this. Verse 8. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in uh, Tanathiresses, one of the things, in the mount of Ephraim, on the north side of Gash. Gash. And all that, everybody say, that generation, all that generation, all that the first brought forth were gathered unto their fathers. Mm -mm -mm. And there arose another. The ones that they brought forth, like our children who are here, the, the generation before them did not teach them effectively and properly and consistently about serving God. And because they failed to do that, the next generation was lost. You see what I'm trying to say? If we don't, as one generation, Set a high bar, teach them properly, be an example for them, own them. You know, I said to myself, do, do, do all the kids that are here, do you know I don't know their names? I don't know all their names. 
Hey, Carlton. No, your name. You know? Hey, came to your soccer game. But I don't know all their names. And most likely, you guys don't know all their names either, do you? So you're trying to help people and you don't even know their names? You see, we're kind of going to go, I'm, I'm serious. The least you can do is know their names. If I got on my knees this morning to pray for, you know, Spencera, if I went on my knees this morning to pray for your kids, guess what? I would know all their names. I have to say, oh Lord, remember Spencera's children. <laughs> yeah. The first one, the second one, the, uh, the, the oldest and the youngest, Lord. And I don't know. I've never taken time to learn their names. You know, we know the popular kids. I'm always, you know, I'm always like, Nehemiah, sit with your mother, you know, so we know, Darian, you know. You know. <sighs> and, I, and the Lord knows you by name. So how can I, as a pastor, say I really care about your children if I don't even know all their names? I really ask myself that question. Rob, are you serious? You don't even know their names, yeah. I know them, but their names, I have no idea. Take the time to learn their names. I'm gonna ask all you, I'm gonna ask them all their names. Now, you know we're pals, right? Come here, come here. You know we're pals. Yeah, you, yeah, you. Because know what we do? I go to your soccer games, and I watch your soccer games. This guy is a wicked soccer player. So good, you know? And I watch his soccer games, and he comes over, and he hugs me, and he leans on me, and we, we hang out together, and we're friends, and we're pals, and everything. He knows me really good. Very hard for the devil to steal him. You know why? Because I know him. And I'm familiar with him, and I'm close to him. Very hard to steal you. You can't steal a sheep if the shepherd and him are really close. It's the truth. I'm going to find him and talk to him. You know, I, I always say, hey, David, I always say, hey, David, 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 stay close to me. And David, is always my message to you. David, just stay close to me. You know? But my goodness, man, I got I to gotta take time to, to, to learn the kid's name. So if you see me, just, you know, Brother Regan, I'm, I'm sitting down there, I'm like, wow, you know? But I don't even know the kid's names. <laughs> Come on, Pastor. Yeah, my job is way more important than that for me not to know your name. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Just yeah. 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 Mm. Yeah. Horrible price. Mm. Yep. Shh. Yep. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, right. Mm. Uh -huh. They couldn't get in. They're coming for the. They're coming for for Tremaine. He's very handsome. Tremaine, you know how old are you now? Eighteen. You're eighteen. 
You know mom's covering can't cover you forever, right? Yeah, you have to, you've got to make your own choices. Even if mom's a Christian, she's the strongest Christian, mom's covering can only cover you for so long. We get to a certain age, anything can happen to you. And God can't do anything because you're of age and you made your choices. The devil can do anything and it's your choice that brings the detriment on you. Mom's prayer. I'm saying it again, this is Charmaine. You can stop them from stealing your children only for so long. Then the children must stop themselves from being stolen. So you get into a point where, you know, you're trying to stop them from coming to the window, but Charmaine's going to open the door. Unless you teach him, don't open the door, son. Don't walk out there with him. Hey, Justin, they're calling you outside. Jesse, come on. Hmm. You understand what I'm saying? That's, that's good, your eyes are open. Parents, make sure that you help your children. I told my son all the time, and you know, we have these conversations, don't let them steal you, Jaron, don't let them steal you. Don't let them steal you. Aaron, don't let them steal you, brother. Your daddy ain't here, if daddy was here, he'd say, Aaron, don't let them steal you. Because I can only cover you for so long. Then you're on your own, and anything can come. Jermaine, you get to be 21, 22, you're not a baptized Christian, anything can come to you. I can only cover you for so long. Okay. Listen to this, listen to this. And all the generation were gathered unto their... I'm done after this one. I think you see where I'm going. They were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which... What did it say? Which knew not ignorance. Eh? Hey? Yes, ignorance. Not even, you know, they were ignorant. Listen, listen, listen. And what did the ignorant do? Listen to this. They knew not the Lord, nor yet the work which God had done. Children who don't know who created them. Children that don't know God made them. The work which he had done. Verse 11. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook the, they forsook the Lord God of their fathers which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods. They began to lust after other gods. Why is that? Because when ignorance is coming into your heart. Hey kids, hey children, uh, parents, don't take for granted that your kids know what you think they know or they should know. Make sure they're knowing. Make sure they're understanding. Ask them questions. Ask them where they are, where they stand, what they think. Amen? Let's just rise to our, let's just rise to our feet. Don't let your generation be stolen. Learn the kids' names. Ask them their names. Black kids, white kids, pink kids, purple kids. Learn their names, not just the popular ones. Thine is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Sitting in your head, Lamp unto my feet, and light unto my path. Thy word, thy word, Lord, is a lamp unto my feet, and light unto when I am afraid, I think I've lost my. You're there at the side of me. 
When I am afraid, think I've lost my way. Jesus, still you're there, right, right beside me. Oh Lord, now nothing will I fear. Jesus, as long as you want it, oh my Lord, we be near me, be near me to the end. With my word, oh, give me your word, Lord. Oh, we need your word, Lord. What you said will not change, Lord, with my word. Oh God, without you.